Well, welcome. Today we're going to be covering the Guide to Computer Forensics Investigations. This is the sixth edition. The material all comes from Cengage. They own and control all copyright material. I am just providing video lectures on the individual chapters for my courses using this textbook. My name is Arthur Salman, and I'm going to be working with you throughout this book. Thank you. Hello and welcome to chapter 4, Processing a Crime Scene and Incident Scene. This chapter focuses on examining the rules for collecting digital evidence, both for the private sector and public sector. Private sector more like businesses, corporations, public sector being law enforcement. You're going to be looking at the guidelines as well as the steps in preparing for an evidence search. You're also going to be looking at how to describe a computer incident or crime scene and how to secure that while collecting your evidence. You're going to be looking at, again, the guidelines for digital evidence, and that includes how to seize digital evidence, all the documentation procedure that goes along with it. You're going to list the procedures for storing digital evidence, looking at how to obtain digital hashes for evidence verification, and you're going to review a case to identify requirement and plan your investigation. Again, these are the lecture videos where some of the tasks might be done in our lab videos. So let's go ahead and jump right on in. So let's go ahead and let's look at what digital evidence is. Digital evidence is any form of stored or transmitted content in a digital form. A laptop, a, a data file, a m33 file a video file all of that is digital evidence the u.s court has ruled that digital evidence will be treated as physical evidence meaning it's tangible there are groups out there that kind of organize the appropriate procedures we have a group such as the scientific work group on digital evidence swgde and they generally set the standard for recovering preserving and examining digital evidence while they set the standard, each country might have additional standards, policies, procedures for digital evidence as it relates to how it's presented in a court system or legal system. So you need to understand that you have to look at what the rules are for collecting digital evidence in your area. If you're in the U.S., there are very strict guidelines, both federally and with each individual state. So as a digital forensic specialist, you're not working alone. You're normally working with a team, and your team will have policies and procedures that are governed by the legal aspect of digital evidence collection in your state, as well as meeting those federal guidelines. So what does the A investigator do? Right? How are they working with digital evidence? Well, the general tasks are identifying uh, the actual evidence or artifacts that might be used as evidence, collect, preserve, or document evidence, analyze, identify, and organize evidence. Again, you're, you're not normally doing this alone. You're working as a team. So you might be analyzing or organizing evidence for a team member or a higher level uh, analyst it just kind of depends i think lastly and the most important one that we forget is that digital evidence collection normally generates a report you know you you did such and such you collected such and such you analyzed such and such all of that goes into digital reporting well you, the reporting needs to be almost perfect so a analyst might rebuild evidence or repeat a situation based off of a report to verify the validity of the report, making sure it's reproducible and flagged as reliable. So those are all really important things that a analyst will do. Collecting digital evidence while at a crime scene or a crime or, or an incident scene is also a very important. Understanding the process Understanding that there's a systematic approach and how to complete those tasks are extremely important. Understanding that digital forensics is a very systematic, very structured process. 
It's not done on the fly. There are rules and procedures that every organization has to collect digital evidence. Why? Because as you collect evidence, to be able to enter it into legal standing or to a court system, you have to have the appropriate paperwork showing that all of it was done correctly, thus being admissible in a legal system. So understanding your company's policies and procedures are crucial. So we said rules of evidence. When you're collecting evidence, there is a certain structure. So there consists a practice, a way to help validate and verify your work. Basically, all of this is aimed to enhance your credibility. If you said you did ABC and you didn't do ABC and it's found out, well, all of your evidence or whatever you collected or touched or worked on, gone, no longer allowed in the court. So credibility is one of those crucial things that an investigator has to have or a forensics analyst has to have. Understanding those rules also means you're following all your state and federal rules of evidence. And again, either state or local or federal or a combination there of both. Again, working with general counsel or following your organizational policies and procedures, thus ensuring that you're following all of the rules that you need to follow as it relates to evidence collection. Evidence admitted into a crime scene can be used both as a criminal suit and civil suit and vice versa. So that means evidence that is collected has to be done correctly to be admitted into our legal system or court system. So keep current on the latest rules and directives for collecting, processing, storing, and admitting digital evidence. And that normally is done by following your organizational policies and procedures because the organization you work for is definitely going to be staying current on their rules because if they do this professionally, they don't want their standing or their credibility dinged because of a mishandling or uh, issue with digital evidence. So they're always going to be staying current and then be working with their partners to stay current. So as long as you as the analyst are following your company's policies and procedures, those are the guidelines that you should be doing. So again, it is crucial and you're going to notice this is repeated over and over and over. Data that you as a analyst uncover or discover uh, following a forensics examination will fall under one, your country's regulations. If you're in the U.S., it could be the federal rules of evidence, FRE, or your state's rules of evidence, depending on what you are working with. So it is actually really important to point out at this moment when you are, let's say, collecting evidence for a private sector, maybe HR wants you to do a forensics analysis of a computer system, and you found child pornography, for example. At that point, that crosses the realm of a private sector to public sector from an HR complaint to a criminal case, because it then transforms to a criminal case, you as the investigator have to know that you have to stop and report to the appropriate legal authority. Because it is a criminal offense, I mean, it's child porn, then you need to contact your local law enforcement following all of the appropriate policies and procedures of your organization the reason you do that is so that you, the investigator, do not compromise the investigation of the criminal offense. So even you as the investigator can accidentally destroy evidence. So that is why when you're doing a private sector investigation, anything that you find that is criminal or falls within a crime, you have to stop and you have to escalate it. That way, you as a private investigator may not have the structure or the rules or the guidance to follow a criminal investigation, or you may not have the legal authority to do so. Once a crime is committed, the court system grants law enforcement the ability to do a legal investigation. The 
court system has authorized that group to conduct the investigation. Because again, once it's criminal, it's outside of the private sector, you have to go with the granting authority. If it's internal to a company and it's not criminal, HR or an executive has the granting authority to grant the investigation. Where if it's criminal, that's not the case. The criminal is going to be the legal or court system. Digital evidence is unlike other forms of physical evidence because it can be changed a lot easier. It can be modified. It can be molested. You turning on a Windows machine modifies the evidence because that boot process generates and modifies logs. So the way to detect these changes is to, is to compare the original data, the, the source data, with a duplicate and then verify. We do that through hashing. Another concern when dealing with digital evidence is the concept of hearsay. Basically, hearsay is secondhand or indirect evidence. And again, when we're dealing with both federal and state regulations, there are more, there are very specific controls that are put on for hearsay evidence as opposed to firsthand or direct evidence. So there needs to be a structure in place to limit the contamination or possible contamination of evidence to preserve the evidence in such a way that is legal, legally admissible into our court system. So there are exceptions to, to this. There are like the business record exception that allows records of regularly conducted activities, memos, reports, emails to be admitted. Business records are also authenticated by verifying that they were actually created at or near the time by or from information transmitted by the person with appropriate knowledge. Again, all of this falls under the rules of evidence, both federally and or the state. And so there is a very specific structure for a lot of these rules that you, the investigator, may not be aware of, but general counsel will. So this is just a, an overview. Business records are also admissible if the record was kept in the course of regularly conducted business activities and it was the regular practice of the business activity to make the record. Records could be normally generated and or categorized into two main groups, computer generated or computer stored. These are going to be the two main forms that we're going to be looking at. But what does that mean? Computer generated and computer stored records are shown to be authentic and trustworthy and they are allowed to be admitted into evidence. Computers generated are considered authentic if the program that created the output is still functionally correct, usually considered an exception to hearsay rule. So keep that in mind. So what is that exactly does that mean? Maybe you have a, an application that generates records every day. As long as the application is still functioning correctly, the reports that are generated by that application are going to be allowed as evidence. Collecting the evidence according to the approved steps of evidence is a must. This helps to ensure that the evidence is kept authentic and it ensures that the data that is collected has been verified, authentic, and is appropriate throughout the entire process essentially ensuring that the chain of custody from when the evidence was collected to it being analyzed and it being stored has remained the same. Thus, it's not questionable that it is legitimate and authentic in nature. Why is this important? That is because, again, normally when this has to go through the legal system, there are lawyers, there's general counsel. They are going to try to discredit the evidence or the investigator or the process or something that removes that evidence from being admissible in the court. So when an attorney challenges digital evidence, they will raise the issue of whether the computer generated records were, were altered or modified or molested or damaged. So again, that's why the documentation is so crucial 
because if there is questionable about the validity of that evidence, the judge may say, no, not admissible, kick it out. So one test to prove that computer stored records are authentic is to demonstrate that a specific person had created those records, the author of a Word document. And that could be done through metadata or the author of a Excel document, again, verified via metadata. Following the appropriate steps in our textbook, you can see how to identify file metadata or the additional attributes of a data file inside a Windows environment. All of this goes back to the word trustworthiness and the validity and the credibility of the investigator. Did the investigator collect this evidence from the crime scene or the incident scene? And how sure are we? How trustworthy are we in that? Well, can we trust that the data that he collected is the data that he analyzed? And there are ways for verification. So the process of establishing digital trustworthiness originates with the written document, the best evidence rule. And essentially what that means is to provide the content of a written document recording or uh, photography or digital evidence, ordinarily the, the file itself is required. So the federal rules of evidence will allow a duplicate instead of the original when it is produced by the same impression as the original. So how does that relate to digital evidence? As long as a bitstream copy of the data is created and maintained properly, a bitstream copy is a bit for bit verified 100% identical version of the digital evidence. The copies can be admitted into court, although they are not considered the best evidence, they are going to be admissible. Normally, you will collect source evidence, hash it, verify it, acquire the evidence, verify the acquisition, the now copy of the evidence matches the source evidence, 100% hash values match, everything matches, and you'll do your analysis off of the copy that was verified bit for bit, identical to the original evidence. That way, you can present the original evidence back to the court system, and you can show within your reporting structure that the evidence that you collected and the evidence that you analyzed is identical and we do that through hashes. However, there are examples of not being able to use the original evidence, and that normally is like a network server or removing a server from the network to acquire the evidence, thus causing harm to the business or its owner. You're not allowed to do that. Like you have to have within reason of your evidence collection. So there are times where evidence collection isn't going to be as straightforward or as easily as it should be. So keep in mind the rules change depending if it's private or public sector. A private sector are organizations, medium businesses, small businesses, large uh, corporations, large businesses, non-government organizations. Non-government organizations are called NGOs and NGOs must comply with all the state public disclosures and federal requirement acts, again, not government organizations. There are guidelines, for example, NGOs do have to comply with public disclosure uh, information, things like the F uh, Federal Freedom of Information Act, FOIA laws. So as a citizen, you can request certain information from private organizations. And this allows citizens to request that the public documents through federal organizations. A special category of private sector businesses are internet service providers, as well as other telecommunication companies, Verizon, AT&T, anyone that provides communication services or internet. Well, internet is a form of communication, so yeah. ISPs can investigate 
computer abuse uh, committed by their employees, but not by their customers. If your ISP is Cox or AT&T, for example, the customer can do something illegal on the network, but the company is not allowed to investigate. The company would then refer that case over to a law enforcement agency because of the structure of, of rules. Investigating and controlling computer incident scenes in the corporate environment is a lot easier than a crime scene. A crime scene or criminal has very strict guidelines set forth by law enforcement and by the court system. Where a private sector scene, there's a lot less stakeholders, a lot less people involved. So it's a lot easier to manage. An incident scene is often the workplace or a work computer where the or the organization or the company has ultimate authority on the evidence that is on the individual machines. And there's a lot more collected data that is preserved because of that environment. So why is this? That is because businesses typically have an inventory. They understand what hardware and software each user has access to, and they also then log all of that access and they have access because they own most of the hardware, if not all of the hardware, for the investigation to actually occur. This helps to identify the tools needed to analyze a policy violation. Typically within our private sector, we are looking at a policy violation. Where if we're doing this in a public case, we are looking at specifically a criminal concern. Corporate policy statements about misuse of digital assets grant the authority to conduct the investigation, typically to HR. This allows the corporate investigator to conduct covert surveillance with little or no cause within the business structure. This also grants access to the company's system without a warrant. Both of those are a lot harder to get when working with a public entity because there is legal requirements for both surveillance and a warrant. But there are some requirements. Companies should have a warning banner and publish policies and procedures normally in a policy handbook or a, a worker handbook, or employee handbook, stating that they do reserve the right to inspect the appropriate technology-based assets at will, and that's pretty common. Not necessarily always is the case, but is common. Private sector investigators should also know under what circumstances they can examine the employee's computer. Again, following the appropriate policies and procedures of the organization. Every organization must have a well-defined process describing when the investigator can actually start. When can the investigation be initiated? By whom? Who has the authority within the organization to say, let an investigation happen? There's a structure that has to be there, and all employees must be made aware of that, again, through policies and procedures typically found in an employee handbook or other policies that are posted. And again, to reiterate, if the private sector investigator does find a criminal issue, the employer can file a criminal complaint with the, complete, uh, with the police. Normally, depending on the severity of the crime, you have to ele uh, escalate it based off of company policies. Employers are usually interested in forcing only company policies, and they're not seeking out to prosecute an employee. However, depending on the severity of the crime, that may differ. Private se uh, sector investigators are, again, concerned with protecting the company, the organization, not so much with enforcing the law. That is a public sector individual. If you discover evidence of a crime during a company policy investigation, again, determine whether the incident does meet the element of criminal law, escalate it accordingly, inform management or your point of contact, stop your investigation to make sure you don't violate any specific rights 
Fourth Amendment uh, restriction for obtaining evidence. Again, once a crime has been committed, it changes the rules. So that is why you have to be careful. Work with the appropriate uh, corporate attorney or general counsel to figure out how to proceed if it does qualify to escalate to law enforcement. Again, following all company policies and procedures accordingly. So since you talked about private sector, now let's talk about public sector. Processing law enforcement crime scenes. You need to be for very familiar with the criminal rules of search and seizure. Again, you're not doing this as an individual. You're working typically as a team, and you will be trained accordingly. If you're doing a law enforcement crime scene, you're working with law enforcement flat out. They normally don't hire contractors that are not properly trained to do this. So just, just to throw that out there. You should also understand how a search warrant works and what to do when you possess one. Again, you're working as a team, so do keep that in mind when you factor this in. Law enforcement officers may also search for and seize criminal evidence only with probable cause. A lot different than private sector. Public sector need probable cause, and this refers to the standard specifying whether a police officer or an officer of the court has the right to make an arrest, conduct a personal or property search, or obtain a warrant for arrests. With probable cause, a police officer can obtain a search warrant from a judge that authorizes a search and seizure of specific evidence related to a criminal investigation or complaint. Again, the court system is the legal granting authority. They will grant limited ability for a law enforcement officer to conduct a certain amount of investigation. If the investigator wants to increase what they're capable of doing, they have to go back to the court system and be granted additional privileges to move forward. That is because when we're dealing with the public sector, there are rights that come into play. Things like the Fourth Amendment. And the Fourth Amendment states that only warrants, particularly describing the place to be searched and the person or thing to be seized, can be issued. Very rarely are you given a blanket, you're allowed to search for this everywhere. N no. Th those types of warrants don't exist anymore. Warrants are going to be more narrowed in scope, thus only granting the officer or the appropriate authority limited ability to search for and have a much more narrow focus. So why do we have to have narrow scope? Like why is it specific that the Fourth Amendment says you can only look for certain things in certain lo locations? We have what's called innocent information. And this is any unrelated information that is not inside the scope of what the court allowed you to search for. If the court says you're allowed to search here and look for this, if you search the, in that specific location and you happen to find uh, evidence of an, an additional crime, then you can go back to the court and you can expand your search warrant. However, if the court said search location A and you search location B and found evidence of a crime, well, you didn't have the right to search area B so even though you found evidence of a crime, guess what? Not admissible. Not, it's poison. So innocent information is again, information in a legitimate area that is not relevant. Often included with the evidence you're trying to recover, but because it's not related, it's flagged as innocent information. Judges often issue a limited phrase of a warrant, allowing the police to separate what is innocent from evidence. If they say, again, we are looking for A, and you happen to find B, well, that's outside of your scope. So there are a lot of nuances when you are dealing with the public sector, things like plain view doctrine. And this basically means if an object falls in plain view of a officer of the court 
who has the right to be in the position that they're actually in and that they are viewing a subject uh, to seize without a warrant and may be introduced as evidence. Basically, if I have a right to be where I'm at and I can see something, you doing something dumb or something illegal, I'm able to seize that without a warrant because it was in plain view and I had the right to be there. If I did not have a right to be there and I see something, well, guess what? I cannot seize it. For plain view doctrine, three main criteria have to exist. The officer is where they have a legal right to be. Ordinary senses must not be enhanced or advanced technology in any way. You can't be using technology to, to smell something, for example. Third, any discovery must be by chance and not a setup. It must be because of circumstance. So that's the general rule for plain view. Plain view also is app applicable to digital evidence when uh, it's to be rejected. Example, a case where the police officer were searching a computer for evidence related to illegal drug trafficking. If an, exam uh, an examiner observes an AFV file, a video file, and finds child pornography, well, then he must get an additional warrant or an expansion of the existing warrant to continue searching for child pornography. That is because he was originally finding drug content and because it, it expanded his search, finding the video would grant him the ability to go further. The single video allows for an expansion or modification of the warrant. He cannot go off on his own looking for it even though he found it. That's what it means by plain view. It was by circumstance that he happened to find this child, uh, child pornography video and thus allows for the expansion of his warrant to uh, increase his scope. So now that we have general guidelines, let's talk about preparing for a search. When you're preparing for a digital forensics search and seizure, you're probably the most important step in the digital forensics investigation. Collecting or acquiring evidence because there is no undo button. So general steps. You need to get the right answer from the victim and an informant. Who could the police detective assign to a case, law enforcement witness, all of that fun stuff. A manager or coworker of the person of interest to the investigation. Again, this allows you to get key answers from those involved. Identifying the specific nature of the case. When you are assigned the case, you must start by identifying the nature. Like, what are you doing? This will involve whether it's a private or public and who is the granting authority. Do you have the authority to conduct the investigation? You, you need to understand that process. Then the nature of the case will dictate how you proceed. What type of assets you're allowed? Is you, do you have a specific scope? Do you have a specific uh, action item that you are investigating? The public versus private sector will dictate that. As you move forward in your digital investigation, you have to understand, well, what type of evidence are you going to be looking at? What type of operating systems? What type of devices? For law enforcement, this step might be difficult because the crime scene isn't as controlled as a private sector is. If you have the ability, you can identify the OS or the devices. Thus, that will dictate what tools you bring. Estimate the size of the appropriate drives and how many devices you need to process. Determine the hardware that's involved that way you can ensure that you're following the appropriate policies and procedures for the devices that are there. If you are not current on your company's mobile acquisition policy and you go to a incident scene and you find that there's a phone, that could be a hindrance. That's why you need to be kept abreast of what you're investigating and what type of devices are there. That way you can be ensuring that you're following all of the appropriate policies and procedures. 
So when you're determining, you can seize the evidence. The type of case and location of the evidence is going to be determined whether you can remove digital evidence. Also, if it's a private versus public sector, what are the rules that govern that? Law enforcement investigators will need a warrant to remove devices from a crime scene. That includes the transportation back to a laboratory environment. If removing the device will irreparably harm a business, then the evidence may or may not be taken off of the site. If it's an active business and the, you're trying to remove a core or key piece of uh, infrastructure equipment, or like a server, for example, you may not get permission. You may get told, no, you're not allowed to remove it. So there are guidelines set so that you cannot just willy-nilly do what you want. So additional complications. What about files? What about data? Are files stored off-site? Are they accessed remotely? Are you removing a piece of hardware that is critical for remote users to, to again, do its business? The availability of cloud storage, which cannot be uh, located physically, also complicates this. Stored on drives where the data from many other subscribers might also then be stored. Also might be stored in a area outside our jurisdiction. You may have data stored on a OneDrive, and it may be located in Australia. I mean, those are concerns. Cloud adds a complexity of digital forensics. If you aren't allowed to take the device to your lab, what do you do? You determine the resources you need to acquire the evidence while on site. And then you do the acquisition on site. And all of that would then be heavily documented for your report. Getting a detailed description of the location. Basically, you want to get as much information about a location of a digital crime as possible. Identify any hazards. Are there hazmat guidelines? For example, you may need a specialized digital forensics bag. Put the target drive in a special hazmat bag that may not damage the drive. Make sure the technician cannot contaminate the bag or decontaminate the bag, depending on what it is. Check for temperatures. And again, some of this is more outside of our normal scope. Like, for example, a investigator probably is not going to be looking for radiation or temperature. But those are things to keep in mind that you need to get a general understanding of the crime scene. And that includes digital forensics uh, photography, making sure to have evidence that is collected correctly. So the private sector and computing investigation is slightly different because, again, there is normally one person involved or responsible for an incident. Law enforcement agencies might be a much larger investigation and there might be many stakeholders that are involved. So designating a lead investigator in the larger scale investigations is the responsibility of law enforcement. Also, there are the stakeholders that might get involved. Private sector is a little easier because again, that's normally fo uh, focusing on corporate policy and procedure versus law enforcement is criminal. So there are slightly different requirements for both types of investigations. So now that we have a general idea of our forensics acquisition understanding and our process, as well as how to do certain things, we need to look at, well, what technical expertise do we need? Well, the fun part when we talk digital forensics we may also need to understand operating systems. Linux, Mac, Windows, they all have different guidelines for how to acquire data. You trying to pull a drive out of a MacBook, that doesn't really work well. So determining where you need to specialize is going to be helpful. Things like operating systems, RAID, or specific type of server hardware because all of that is going to be slightly different than your average device. 
you want to find the right person and that can be a challenge. So educate specialists and those techniques help prevent data corruption, helps prevent evidence damage, helps prevent mishandling of evidence. So what tools do you need to bring? We are going to a crime scene, well, what do you need? So you need to create an initial response field kit, as well as an extensive response field kit. These allow you to be responsive. So the re initial is a lightweight, easy to transport. The extensive does require a little bit more time, does have all the tools, and it does have all of the, the main things. Do you need a forensics toolkit? What do you need to include in your digital forensics toolkit? Do you need a laptop, a flash drive, multiple flash drives? It's not a single item. It's You're supposed to be looking at what you may need. Do you need a flashlight? Do you have batteries for your flashlight? And so forth. So your initial response, a small toolkit, large capacity drive, screwdrivers, the appropriate data connections, a, a write blocker, flashlight, and so forth. That way you have the majority of the tools necessary to do what you need to do. And that includes digital camera, logs, sta uh, anti-static bags, markers, and again you can never forget USB flash drives. And again, the amount is going to be based off of your company's policies and procedures, but they're definitely going to be there. You may also need for your more extensive kit, your initial response kit, your laptop, uh, gloves, again, screwdrivers, uh, magnifying glass for some reason, maybe a paper, larger capacity drives, additional drives, additional screwdrivers, uh, additional bags. So again, this is going to be an extensive response kit. It's going to have more than just your initial. So it may have the same similar items, but more. We talked about screwdrivers. So your extensive kit might have additional specialty bits where your initial one may not, because you may not need security bits on all of your investigations, but there might be some that are necessary. Again, realize that you're part of a team. You're not by yourself. So before you initiate a search, you're going to be looking at the facts, plans, objectives with your team. You're going to outline goals. You're going to outline what digital evidence you need to collect, which is going to be volatile, and what is the order. Typically, memory is going to be the first type of evidence you collect because that is very volatile meaning it modifies and changes and goes away very quickly. Slow response means evidence can be lost, so you need to take that into account. So when we're looking at securing a scene, the goal is to preserve the evidence, keep information confidential. We need to define an appropriate perimeter. That might mean setting up yellow tape. That might mean finding the appropriate legal authority for the incident and understanding what you're allowed to do. For a crime scene, for a legal authority, corporate, uh, that's gonna be the authority to grant the investigation for the policy violation. For a crime scene, that could be including uh, obstructing justice or failing to comply with police officers, but that is, again, the same general thing. You set up your perimeter and you set up the appropriate procedures to control that crime scene to prevent anyone from damaging the crime scene. There is also professional curiosity, and that can destroy evidence. So we need to keep that in mind. When you're involving police officers or other profession who aren't part of the crime scene, they may accidentally cause damage. There is also automated fingerprint identification system, APHIS. So if you are having to deal with digital uh, fingerprints, there's a computerized system for identifying fingerprints. 
And again, that's normally done through law enforcement. Private sector normally don't have this. Police can take elimination prints of everyone that have access to the crime scene, thus to eliminate those that were legitimately supposed to be there. If you have fingerprints of people that lived there, well, they were supposed to be there. So, I mean, those fingerprints may not be a concern. If you find a set of fingerprints that belong to someone that isn't supposed to be there, well, that could be evidence. What about seizing evidence? So law enforcement can seize evidence when they have a proper warrant. That is because they're governing the court system, have outlined what they're allowed to do. The, the governing organization says that they are able to, to seize evidence. That's the granting authority. In a private sector, the corporate investigator might have the authority only to make an image of the device. It really all depends on the, what the governing authority says you're allowed to do. When you're seizing evidence for a criminal investigation, there are very strict guidelines following the appropriate state and federal guidelines. And most of them are based off of the Department of Justice standards for seizing digital evidence. If we're talking a civil investigation, they follow the, the same general rules. Consult with general counsel always. If you're the investigator, if you're following your company's policies and procedures, realistically, these are managed and updated by your organization and by general counsel. Because again, they do not want a mishap of digital evidence. So they are always constantly looking at how to update the appropriate policies and procedures. That is why your role as a analyst is to stay current with your company's policies and procedures. Now keep in mind, the evidence you collect is all gonna be based off of what's the nature of the case. What's the alleged violation? What's the alleged crime? Is it a private sector policy violation? Is it a criminal investigation? That will dictate how to move forward. Ask the appropriate examiner of the organization, what do you need? Do you need the entire device, all peripherals? Realistically, all of this is going to be, what's, what is your scope? This sets up your scope. This allows you to understand what you're going to be accomplishing. So you probably won't be asking your supervisor. It will be based off of the situation. You get on a scene, you examine what is there, and then you collect accordingly. Though if you want to know what to bring, that is slightly different. If you have the ability to ask what is present, that would then dictate what you would be bringing to the crime scene. You can also ask, ask your supervisor in the organization, is the suspect you're investigating in the immediate area of the device. Is there a question that it may be compromised or that they may delete content? Is it possible that the suspect has damaged or destroyed a electronic device? Will you have to separate the suspect from the device itself? Is it something that's going on currently? Or is the evidence or the device already in possession of a a proper authority. So how do you process a incident or crime scene? There are guidelines. Basically, you document, you keep a journal, your, all your activities, you secure the scene. If not you, then someone on your team. You be professional, courteous. You remove people who are not part of the investigation. You don't want them to contaminate what you're trying to do. You take lots of videos and still recordings of the area surrounding the devices. That way, they can be duplicated later. You pay attention to the details. You may get photos of the incident or the crime scene. You check the state of the devices as quickly as possible. It doesn't necessarily have to be a computer, but it could be a mobile device. Based off of the status of the device, then you can figure out how to proceed. Don't cut the electrical power to running systems. 
if it's an older Windows 98, 95 MS DOS type system, you don't want to do that. You want to save data from any application as safely as possible without making minimizing modifications. Document the process. Record all activities, all windows, all shell sessions, everything. Take lots of notes, document everything. When you copy data from a live suspect's device, document it. Close the application and shut down the computer. Follow the policies and procedures of the organization. That is going to be a lifesaver. Most people like to ignore that part, but that is what's going to save your butt. If you're following your organizational guidelines, then you should not have an issue. Bag and tag evidence, following the appropriate procedures. As, uh, assign one person to collect and log evidence. Photos, videos, evidence, wherever the evidence is. Before you touch the evidence, you document where it is. You have photos of the evidence. That way, there is not a concern of, oh, well, where did I get this? You have outlines and you have documentation of everything. Tag all evidence. Maintain separate logs. Never just rely on one. Maintain constant control of the evidence. Anything that is collected, there has to be a chain of custody. You collected it from where? Who has had the ability to access that? That is part of the chain of custody. One of the last things you want to do is look for information related to the investigation. Are there passwords? Are there PIN numbers? Are there any indications of what passwords might be in the, the area? You want to collect as much information as possible about the incident as well as the suspect or victim. Collect documentation, media related to the investigation, hardware, software, backups, manuals, anything that is relevant to what's going on. That can be used to maybe figure out a encryption password. It may be used to find additional information that you did not necessarily know at the beginning of your investigation. Because we know there are specialty systems, things like RAID, we need to be understanding of sparse acquisition. These are techniques for extracting evidence from a very large data system. Extract only data relevant to the evidence of your case. They may say that these are the key words or key phrases that you're allowed to search for. Then you only collect evidence based off of that. Minimize how much data you need to analyze. Drawback to this technique is it doesn't recover data in any of the free or slack space. So deleted content is not analyzed. So using a technical advisor, that's always feasible in certain situations. A technical advisor helps to list the tools that are necessary for a certain uh, incident response. They'll guide you about what uh, location data, uh, records, how to do certain things, types of training, and they might also create warrants by itemized items that you need. Responsibilities of a technical advisor, they need to know uh, all aspects of used systems, they need to direct investigator handling of sensitive material. They need to understand how to secure the uh, system and the, the crime scene. They help with documentation. They do conduct some basic field training. They document the appropriate activities and they help with search and seizure of content. So we keep saying the word document. What exactly does that mean? You need to record activities and findings as you work maintaining a journal or a step-by-step -step process so that as you process evidence, everything is captured. Your goal is to be able to reproduce the same result following the same steps. A journal will serve as a reference that the documents, the method that you use to process the digital evidence. That way you can ensure that you're following the same steps and key, it's reproducible. So. After documenting, we also have to talk about process and handling. You need to maintain the integrity of the evidence, always. 
as when you collect the evidence, you follow the chain of custody. You need to make sure that everyone handling the evidence is doing it as appropriately as possible. Steps when you're creating an image file. Basically, you do the data acquisition. You capture the image, maybe to a large drive or to a SAN. You start your forensics tool for analysis. You verify the source evidence and the acquired image. You run a hash against them to ensure the original and the clone are identical. Once that is done, the source evidence or the, uh, the original evidence is secured again. It is locked up. It's put away. You're not conducting your investigation off of the original media. You're doing it based off of the cloned copy. So storing of digital evidence, the media is you're, you're going to be using is going to be depending on how long you need to keep it. If you're using CDs or DVDs, they have a lifespan. It's not inevitable. So a CD or DVD is made to last two to five years. A USB drive is a little more durable, but they're not made to last, you know, five to seven years. Magnetic tapes, they're made to last. They're made to last 30 plus years. So you do need to understand how to properly store these devices to maximize their life. But there are other technologies like the super digital uh, tapes specifically designed for large RAID. They can store, again, a whopping one terabyte or larger. Those last, you know, again, about 30 years. We also have the smaller external drive that connect through a workstation SCSI or external SATA type card. You cannot rely on one media storage to preserve your evidence. There is not one that fits all. You also need to make sure that you always have two copies of every image. So when you are working off of a forensics clone, you don't just do one. You have two always. That way, if one is damaged, you have a recover a backup. You can also use different tools to create the two different images. You may use a imaging tool for one and a different imaging tool to capture the other. As long as the hash values are identical, then you're okay. To help maintain the chain of custody, you have to restrict access to who has access to the evidence. That means they're not just free-for-alls. They may be locked up in a secured area, but there could be a process to check in and out that evidence. Labs should have a sign-in roster as well as video for all of the evidence. You might need to retain the evidence indefinitely, so you also need to keep that in mind. And if that is the case, you need to work with local law enforcement and following the appropriate state and federal guidelines for how long evidence must be retained. Here's an example of an evidence activity log. Again, you're looking at who had access, when they did it, when it was checked back in, and you want to document as much as possible. So this is a evidence activity form. When you're dealing with evidence, you're also going to create an evidence custody form. An evidence custody form will serve to identify the evidence, identify who's touched the evidence, and the dates. You can add additional information like hashing algorithms and things like that, depending on your company's organizational policies and procedures. You need to include any detailed information you might need to reference. Just because you remember right now doesn't mean you're going to remember in a year from now or two years from now when looking at a key piece of evidence. So you want to document as much as possible specifically so that if it is some time between now and the next time you have to look at the evidence, you can quickly refresh your memory. Evidence bags also include labels or evidence forms so that you can document what you're using it for. We also have our digital hashing. That is going to act as a way of verification. These are going to be mathematical formulas that determine the contents of a piece of evidence, and that way you can identify if it's identical or not. So we have variations. We have things like MD5. Again, this is a hash value that will use a mathematical formula 
to determine if there is any modification of data. A space in a Word document is modification. Any slight modification will modify the hash and we're comparing the hash values to identify if evidence was molested or altered. So there are a few rules for forensics hashes. They cannot be predictable. No hash values are the same. And if anything changes, the hash value then must also then change. MD5 and SHA are the two big ones. However, both MD5 and SHA collisions have definitely occurred. A collision is when you have data that sadly has had similar hash values or identical hash values for evidence that is not identical. Most digital forensics hashing needs need to be satisfied with a non-keyed hash value. So some type of unique hash value number that's generated. In Linux, that's the MD5 sum. The keyed hash set is created by an encryption utility like a secret key. You can use MD5 functions in our imagers to obtain our digital signatures of the file. And these will help minimize collisions. Here's an example of a hash. And again, we're going to be doing our hashing in our lab videos so that we can see uh, how we can accomplish that. Lastly, reviewing a case. General tasks when you're a forensics investigator. Identify the requirements, plan, conduct, complete, document, review, critique, go through it again, make sure everything is reproducible, lessons learned, and repeat. A sample civil investigation. Most cases in a corporate environment are considered low-level investigations, non-criminal, so that's good to know. Common activities and practices, again, recovering uh, PSTs or email files. Covert surveillance, that's always a fun one. Again, has to be documented in policies and procedures. It's not just willy-nilly. They need to be followed based off of the company's policies. And there could also be sniffing of network traffic, and that's going to be used for data transmission. And that will be on the cybersecurity side of things, as well as the investigative side of things. An example of a criminal investigation, fraud, check fraud, homicide. Some of these may need a warrant to start the seizing of evidence. Fraud, depending on the amount of fraud. Homicide, God, yes. I mean, homicide is a criminal activity. Fraud, if it is based off of a, a low amount, may not be considered criminal. So you have to keep in that keep that in mind based off of your state regulations. But again, if it is deemed a criminal, the investigation is now public through law enforcement, and there has to be the appropriate governing body that will then start or initiate the investigation. Here's an example of a room. If you have a connected case or a connected cable, the search warrant may then have to be expanded based off of the information that was gathered. Reviewing the background information of a case is also important. Thoroughly, uh, throughout our book, we've looked at data files but you need to understand that the data files should have some type of process. So you want to understand the background of a case. So our book used a hypothetical M57 patent case. It's a startup company. A computer was sold on Craigslist. It now had adult pornography. It was traced back to the M57 patent. The employee is now a suspect of downloading the pornography and then how we process that. You plan the investigation, you contact the appropriate people because there is adult con or there's child pornography on it. It's no longer private, it's now public. So you have to contact the police and follow the appropriate procedures. 
you follow the appropriate outline steps and you conduct your investigation. All right, that sums up this chapter in a nutshell. We reviewed what is digital evidence, what is public, what is private sector, what companies should do, what are some of the requirements for initiating a case, both from the private and public sectors. We looked at protecting the safety and health of the integrity of the evidence. We looked at guidelines for processing a incident or crime scene. Again, lots of photos, documentation. We looked at the general guidelines for collecting digital evidence. We looked at hash values for verification. And then lastly, we looked at a general run through of analyzing the evidence. If there's any questions, please let me know. All right, now that we've wrapped up some of the material for this chapter, are there any questions? There's a lot of different material covered. So again, the key thing is, as you're going through the material, whether it be the reading, whether it be the videos, ask questions, write questions down. The more that you can engage your brain in this material, the better you are at retaining the information. So again, questions, please feel free to, to reach out and we will go from there. Thank you, and I look forward to working with you throughout the remainder of these modules.